So good morning, and thank you for joining us uh, for our panel on managing late cycle risk in multifamily real estate. And I would like to, as an opener, uh, invite our panel to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their varied and experienced background. So Ben, if you could just start it off. Yes, yeah, so I work for PIM Real Estate Group. We are a uh, real estate uh, private equity firm based in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we focus on the southeast and southwest United States only, uh, specifically apartment communities. We've been around for 26 years and I run all the acquisitions and the capital markets for the firm. I work for, I work for uh, Cypress Capital Group. We're a small uh, family office. We, we're doing investments in both Silicon Valley, San Francisco area, and the New York City metropolitan area, primarily in uh, uh, single family <clears throat> and multifamily. Prior to that, uh, I had a position at TI Cref for 27 years and ran their mortgage and real estate division, uh, which was obviously dramatically different, $80 billion in assets versus what uh, we're managing today. I'm also involved with a technology company, which is pretty interesting for an old real estate guy to be involved in that, um, but we're effectively looking at doing a, a tech platform that'll be utilizing, um, uh, that'll be converting to impact investing through doing uh, lending uh, for sustainability projects uh, in, in the real estate area. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Chris Aronson, I serve as the Chief Commercial Officer for CompStack. Uh, my experience, uh, both inside and, and outside of real estate, is running uh, technology, analytics, and, and data businesses. Uh, prior to Comstack, I was CEO of a company called EDR, which provided uh, data analytics and a SaaS platform, uh, primarily to lenders, to help them assess the, the risk and valuation and compliance of, of real estate. Uh, Comstack's uh, mission is to bring uh, long overdue transparency into the commercial real estate uh, sector. Um, and uh, this is an area that's getting uh, considerable investment uh, in the so-called prop tech category, uh, which I'm a part of. Um, our business was started by a real estate broker uh, who uh, most commercial real estate brokers, I think if you speak to them, live on comps. and. Uh, Sunday night ritual for Michael Mandel was calling his friends, his colleagues, even his competitors, trying to find that that comp or that series of comps that would support the uh, the investment that he was working on. And uh, sometime around those Sunday nights, he's like, "My goodness, there must be a better way to do this, a more modern way to do it." And that's really where Comstack was born. Uh, we gather our data uh, via crowdsourcing. So today, uh, over 25,000 appraisers, brokers, and uh, and research managers. Uh, contribute data to our platform, and uh, in exchange for that, they receive credits, and that allows them to unlock uh, data that uh, might be useful for them in, in whatever they're working on. Uh, that's allowed us to grow to national, uh, have a national footprint or national expansion. We're covering uh, 12,000 cities, uh, over uh, 2 million comps uh, on the platform today, and, and nearly, uh, or I should say, over 9 billion uh, square feet of, of real estate captured on the platform. Uh, we consider our data to be the most precise income data for commercial real estate in uh, industrial, office, and retail. Um, and I was just listening to that uh, panel, uh, fascinating discussion on opportunity zones. We just added opportunity zones uh, to that to our to our platform. Finally, we have an analytics platform that allows folks to get the most out of that data, uh, in, and uh, and we're increasingly sending that data through APIs uh, to our customers' own systems. Thank you. Uh, so, as I pick up the paper every morning, I'm now seeing uh, headlines that are talking and discussing recession. So, a headline, a couple of headlines that I've been reading lately are, J.P. Morgan considers moving thousands of workers out of New York City to prep for a downturn. And IBM on the hunt for massive New York City office space as it weighs WeWork exit. And another one that says it's scary. Uh, New York's economy is humming, but dark clouds are gathering. And so if I stand out here on the corner of 32nd Street and Park Avenue, and I say to everybody that walks by, we're having a recession, uh, we're gonna have a recession, 
uh, pretty soon they're going to say, that Andrew Lazarus guy from Barrel Consulting, he's a genius. So, uh, Chris, maybe you can start out and help us out a little bit here, because uh, it's really about the data and what the data says about where we're going in terms of a downturn in the market. So where does Comstack see the data and where are we at in, in terms of, of the marketplace? Yeah, great. Well, uh, I think those actions, uh, if, if we're not at the end of the cycle, uh, most constituents are acting that way. Um, you know, you can look at real estate, which has a, a pretty traditional time-based cycle, and if you lay that on the calendar today, uh, you, you'd be hard-pressed not to conclude that we're at the end of that cycle. Um, but as we look a little bit more closely at the, at the data, um, you know, it, it might indicate that, you know, providing no material changes to the economy, that, that we might be uh, in store for some extra innings. Uh, pricing sort of across the industry remains flat as you expect, but uh, we see cap rates settling in, particularly in office space, uh, at roughly 6.5%. And, and when we see numbers like that, uh, we start to see perhaps there is an opportunity for us to continue to grow. Um, so where are these opportunities? Uh, we're clearly in the late stages. Where are the opportunities that we see? Uh, and I'll touch upon three of them. Um, First of all, there, you know, there's, a, there's regional opportunities in, in the office world. Uh, as, as major cities like New York uh, start to price out from emerging companies, emerging businesses, that's generated some pretty heady demand in secondary markets. Uh, Austin, Nashville, Denver, uh, these markets are growing very rapidly in the office space and, uh, and, and seem to have quite a bit of runway to go. So there clearly is uh, investment opportunities on a regional basis. But I think it's hard to uh, look at commercial real estate without taking a look at what's going on in retail. Uh, the traditional brick and mortar retail businesses, uh, I've heard oftentimes referred to as, as, as retail Armageddon. Uh, my goodness, the price points of, of those businesses have come down considerably. Um, and that is opening the door to a number of, of opportunities here late in the cycle uh, for redevelopment. Uh, I was speaking to one of our clients, an investor, the other day, and, and they're, they're buying up malls um, and, and redeveloping those malls for, for new use cases that were never before available because these price points have come so low. Um, most recently, they bought a mall in, in the Midwest, uh, 350,000 square feet, mostly empty, um, save for an Applebee's and, and one or two other uh, retail uh, outlets. <clears throat> and, and they're uh, able to invest in that property and bring self-storage into that mall and take up 75% of that space and, and generate uh, quite, quite a nice profit. So there are redevelopment opportunities out there in the wake of this, uh, of this retail uh, downturn. But I think the most interesting area, uh, for me at least, is, is on the other side of that uh, retail equation, uh, where brick-and-mortar retail has suffered losses, e-commerce uh, continues with its double-digit growth. And, uh, you know, the, the consensus here is that we're far from adequate in terms of the infrastructure that's in place today uh, to get all those uh, products to us uh, faster. And faster is a key term. Uh, we have, seem to have an insatiable appetite for uh, instant gratification when we order something online and bringing that into our homes. Uh, and here is a, an enormous investment opportunity that, that we're seeing. As I look at our data, uh, it, it might surprise you. You wouldn't think of, of Los Angeles or the Los Angeles metro area as an industrial uh, growth area, but we saw more leases signed in the LA metro area, including Orange County, than anywhere else in the country, over 75 million square feet of, uh, of industrial leases a uh, year to date. And as a matter of fact, 50% uh, of the industrial leases signed here in the United States uh, were signed in, uh, in, in major cities or, or, or just outside of major cities. Now, why is that happening? Well, that's the critical aspect of the timeliness of this supply chain transformation. Uh, that so-called last mile of logistics is really where these investments uh, are occurring. Look no further than Amazon's uh, third quarter earnings release. Uh, their, their logistics expenses and, and shipping expenses uh, year over year for third quarter increased by a half a billion dollars. 
Um, they hired 100,000 people, most of those in the logistics area, and a big concentration of that in the, in the so-called uh, last mile. Um, that delta, uh, as we get to the holiday season in the fourth quarter, uh, could go as high as a billion and a half dollars in additional uh, investment and expenditures um, just to get those prime members their packages uh, in, in the next day commitment, which they see as a, as a really uh, important differentiator for, uh, for their business. Um, and, and I'll just close with saying, finally, investors have taken note. Uh, Blackstone was mentioned in, in the previous panels, uh, obviously a very astute investor. Blackstone is, has, a, has accumulated over a billion square feet uh, in uh, industrial space uh, worldwide, and they continue to invest in this space, and it's, it, they're extremely bullish on this notion of uh, e-commerce and, and the associated impacts of, of logistics. So those are three areas, I think, late-stage uh, opportunities, uh, at least that we're seeing in this, uh, in this cycle. Thank you. Uh, ben, where do you see and identify dislocation in asset values across markets? And where are you seeing opportunities uh, in the multifamily area? Well, you know, most of the dislocations that we're seeing in asset values, I mean, you have to think about uh, what's caused, what's occurred um, in the period that's brought us into the uh, late cycle. And it's mainly the low interest rates and how that's affected how um, capital has, um, and how the low interest rates have affected how uh, investors are looking at uh, yield. So for example, there's so much money that's chasing deals these days and the interest rates are so low that it's pushing up asset values. And so what we do is we look at uh, cap rate conversions that's occurring in multifamily um, across a basket of markets that we're in. For example, uh, if you look at uh, class A and class B uh, multifamily, the uh, gap between cap rates in class A and class B was about 35 basis points. Um, nationally uh, five years ago. Uh, three years ago, the gap was about uh, 31 basis points. Last year, the gap was about 26 basis points. Uh, this year, the gap is about 21 basis points. So we're seeing some convergence between the Class B and Class A. Now when you look within those markets for, say, like a, a Charleston or a Dallas, for example, um, five years ago, the gap between Class B and Class A in Charleston was 44 basis points. Today is 19 basis points. So you've got about 20, uh, 24 basis point gap there. And then we look at Dallas-Fort Worth area. Five years ago, the gap was about 54 basis points between Class B and Class A. And right now, the gap is about 22 basis points. So you're looking at uh, 32 basis points in Dallas, about 23 basis points in Charleston, versus about uh, a 13 basis point difference uh, nationally. So we're seeing a lot of dislocations there. Now, if you're looking at assets to own going into a recession, uh, we believe that Class A assets uh, in these particular markets is the way to go because if the cap rates ever do start to expand again, there's going to be a disproportionate impact on the Class B assets as um, you kind of get away from some of that convergence. So, Joe, uh, so Joe uh, oversupply of capital. Um, low interest rates, historical low interest rates. Um, how's that impacting your ability to acquire? Uh, and what does that say about the end of the cycle? You know, I've been doing this for over 30 years. And I'll tell you, in the first discussion today, they were talking about whether you should be, uh, you know, how you should do your investing. Should you be using uh, AI or should you be using some sort of um, uh, people type decision making going into this thing. And I'll tell you what, after 30 years of doing this and living through about probably five cycles, I swear I could use a computer and a logarithm and everything else to help me because I don't understand it right now. You've got, you know, normally in real estate cycle, you know, things go up, then they go down and, and, and you, it, it lasts a couple of years on, on each side of the, uh, of the cycle. Today, if you take a look at all of the, you know, all of the, the, the demographics and the data that we're talking about as far as uh, occupancies, rent growth and all, things are relatively flat, but things are still pretty good. Um, if you take a look at um, the things that you can't control, and this is where the, the real uh, intuitiveness of, of the business uh, is and the real question mark is, 
is the fact that government's in, now involved in a whole lot of, of the real estate business and certainly in the multifamily side. If you take a look at, at California, you look at their, their Proposition uh, 13 and the, and the impact it's had on taxes. Now that's on single family. Uh, and you, and you've, you've basically got a, a minimal increase in your tax base. Meanwhile, your budget's going through the roof. Um, things can't be changed out there without a vote. People are not going to vote for it. They've created, in and, of, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, but they've created a housing disaster. And if you look at McKinsey's done studies on it, if you look at FHA, VA, they've done studies on it. It's a serious problem where they can't, simply can't catch up, and it's created an incredible demand uh, for product. Um, one of the, and, it, and then you look at some of the demographic changes that have occurred. You take a look at the millennials, and despite all the, you know, the, 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 the raps about millennials, you know what, millennials between ages and, and 34 have um, their, their uh, uh, unemployment rate has gone down to the lowest level in over 15 years. I think it's like 4.3%. If you look at their income level, it's well over $150,000. So they've got money and they've got jobs and they've got to buy, they've, they need housing and housing is in a shortage. You also take a look at, at the demographic of, of people who are, and, and this is Andrew and I were talking about, this, this is us, the guys who are, uh, people who are in, in the age group of you know 55 to 65, they're selling their houses and they're going back into the multifamily uh, arena because they don't want to own homes. And what are they looking for? They're looking for, you know, higher end. These these type of, of projects aren't uh, necessarily being developed or, or or aren't out there. So you've got real issues that are occurring that are not historically quantifiable. The old line of, of you go where, where the jobs is still sits in, in real estate, it still uh, sits well today. What we're doing in, in Cypress Capital is we're in, you know, we don't have a lot of money to invest, so we're in two markets, basically San Francisco market and the New York market. And that's where the jobs are. Take a look at the New York market and you look at the technology uh, jobs that are coming in, even though you know, some of the old finance jobs are going down, you know, moving out and going down to some of the, the secondary cities. It's creating demand down there, but at the infill is just incredible. Technology, I, mean, I think the number uh, through the third quarter of, uh, of venture capital uh, funding into technology in the New York area is 3.6 billion. Last year it was 4.1 billion, so it's expected to exceed uh, uh, last year's uh, investments. That's creating jobs. That's creating very smart people with a whole lot of money who need housing, and the housing isn't there, and that's creating opportunities. Okay, but as long as, as the government's going to be involved in this with that, that factor of keeping rents down, are developers going to develop? Are, are people going to go ahead and buy buildings like we used to do and, and, and uh, remove tenants, increase rents, make it economically viable, but also create a product for the tenants? It's a really, really confusing market, and there's no right or wrong answer. People are relatively positive about the market, but the guys who who bought projects over the last couple of years with the new housing, with the new rent regulations, they used to sell them in you know, three to four years, make a nice gain and, and move on. Now they've got to hold them until, until the government figures out what's going on. Um, real estate, is, especially fa for family business, is still a great place to put money. Um, institutional money, though, is overwhelming the market, you know, as, as Ben said, and it's, it's driving cap rates. So it's an interesting time. Okay, so thank you. So in continuing the theme and the discussion about a downturn in the market, and or maybe a better term is a readjustment in the market, um, Ben, what assets do you think have the greatest ability to perform um, in, a, in a readjustment or a realignment of the cycle? You know, I would say, Class A, in Class A suburban, in markets where the rents are affordable, have the greatest ability to do that. So, um, for example, uh, when we look at a deal, uh, we're typically looking at what's our going in basis going to be. Um, you know, for example, in Phoenix, you know, our headquarters is there. We once owned about a quarter billion dollars of assets in Phoenix. We sold out our sold out of our last deal uh, last year, just because the asset values are, uh, from our view, are way too out of control. Uh, class A there, you're going to pay two hundred to two hundred forty thousand dollars per unit, and you're in a situation where 
the, um, the income and the types of jobs that are in that market don't support uh, that type of valuation because the, the tenant continues to be uh, stretched in terms of you know, rising debt levels and things like that. You know, just kind of going back to things leading up to a recession, historically, if you look back 30, over the last 30 years, every recession was preceded by three to four years of consecutive increases in the short-term interest rates and the prime rate, combined with three to four years of consecutive increases in the delinquencies in auto loans and consumer loans. And uh, that was true in 2018. The only difference that happened uh, at that point was you had uh, a new administration that did a lot of deregulation. You had the tax cuts that um, put a lot of money back into the economy with, uh, particularly with um, the immediate expensing of the, the cap with the um, fixed assets. And so I think that pushed us into uh, extra innings. And what uh, is of historical significance is that for the first time in maybe two administrations, we're in a situation where you have uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy that is complementary within the last quarter. I mean, within the last quarter, now you've got the uh, Fed reducing rates, and now we're, we have not yet put ourselves into a recession, but we have, uh, for the first time in 30 years, rates decreasing, potentially going into a recession. So that's interesting, which may add some more innings into the current cycle. Now, when you look at the auto loan delinquencies, what was kind of disturbing to me Q1 and Q2 of 2019, uh, auto loan delinquencies that were at 4.6, above 4.6%. When you look back to 2009, they were at 4.3%. So we're all, we've already exceeded that number in auto loan delinquencies. And uh, so it seems like it's imminent. Now, in terms of the assets that have the greatest ability to perform uh, through these markets, it's going to be assets where, um, you know, rents are, I would say, less than $1.55 per square foot. Uh, in markets where top five uh, job growth, top five to 10 uh, employment growth, where you go in, what we're looking at mainly, so a recent deal that we did in Charleston, because we just love the Charleston market for the reasons I indicated earlier, we bought a brand new deal, uh, was built in 2018, had a very quick lease up, and they leased up so quickly that the rents were $123 uh, below market, below the competitive set, it was one of the best assets in the market. So that's the type of deal that we can get into and say, well, we have some immediate upside. What happens if, a, if a, uh, a downturn comes and we have lower rents in the market? Well, this property is going to be somewhat insulated from that because the comps that are not as good as this one will be forced to lower their rents before we do. So we have worst case scenario, maybe we're not increasing rents as rapidly or increasing rents at all, but we're not decreasing rents most likely. And the rents are affordable. And we're in an area where you know, there's significant um, job growth, where there's significant relocations of, of, of manufacturing uh, going on. So in those types of markets, uh, we believe have assets that have the greatest ability to withstand a recession, class A, and not the class B. I and mean, I'll say with the that this is the situation with the class B assets uh, for apartments. Uh, there's a lot of, of value add stories that are being told about the class B assets. And that's one of the reasons for the convergence in cap rates that we're seeing over the last five years. You know, you have an asset you think you're going to put uh, ten to $15,000 per unit in it, and uh, operators are willing to pay a little bit more uh, for that asset because they think they're going to increase rents. Well, if the economy turns in the wrong direction, you've got a Class B asset that you've improved with granite countertops and all these types of things. It's not going to compete with the Class A asset that because you're going to have the functional obsolescence that you just can't get away from in these older assets. So Class A, in our view, is, the, is definitely uh, the way to go, affordable Class A. Thank you. So, uh, Joe, where do you see opportunities um, in a changing cycle? I know we've talked about uh, renting versus buying. Uh, is, that, is, is that something that you're seeing um, in your own buying model? No, there was, there was a study done just recently, I think it was a, one of the uh, agencies did it, and the cost of, of owning property is still higher than the cost of renting, which is, which is the reason logically some of the groups that I mentioned earlier, the millennials and, and, and the uh, uh, baby boomers are, are going into to the multifamily and renting. 
um, you know, the cost of a house is high, but interest rates are low, so that helps. But it's, it's still the, the cost of entry, uh, so that's, that's an issue. And you, if you get into any of the urban lifestyles, you're not going to own houses here. I mean, that obviously, people want to live in an urban environment, um, whether it be a New York City, whether it be a Brooklyn, Bronx, I mean, Brooklyn uh, in, the, in this area, or even if you go out into Denver, if you take a look at Denver, I mean, it's an urban environment as it's grown um, uh, outside the, out of the core city. But you know, one thing I, I've got to mention is, is the, you know, the real, real estate is, money is made and no matter what you read, no matter what they tell you, debt drives real estate. And the issue right now is debts, the debt is very low. Interest rates are low. They've lowered interest rates. But I'm going to make a prediction. I swear to God, you can write this down. I bet you I'm right. Interest rates someday are going to go up. Um, and when they do go up, you're going to be reading in the Wall Street Journal about another crisis in the commercial real estate area. Now, that's not going to happen this year. It's not going to happen next year. But it's going to happen. And, you know, the, the issue of, of, of debt on a property, all of these billionaires that you realize, you know, that, that started out and now are, are in the billionaire list, they all started because they created a product and they created value. But then they also le used leverage wisely, or they used it, you know, in a ridiculous manner, but they came out through it. Remember, mortgage debt is non-taxable, so developers just love it. Every time you refinance that property, that's money that I can put in my pocket and not pay taxes on. And, the, and with interest rates being low, there's always that, that thought, God, let's just borrow more, borrow more, borrow more. So, the, I mean, that's another issue that's sitting there. And if you're starting to look at some of the, for example, the public companies, all, uh, they've maintained their, their debt to uh, capitalization level. If you look at the private developers, no, they've levered up. And there's, there's a bubble there, and I don't know when it's going to occur. It's not going to occur in the foreseeable future, but it's going to occur um, in the next couple of years. And there will be a bubble, and it will explode, and then we'll all sit there and, you know, uh, people with money are going to make a lot of money because I'm going to go buy those properties. Um, but you, you'll be reading about that, too. Okay. It's also interesting with uh, all the debt they've taken on is, you know, you have to deal with, uh, you know, Section 163J with perhaps not being able to write off all that debt now. And you still go on all this debt in the past, and uh, how are they going to deal with that? So, Chris, um, what role will the emergence of data play in forecasting these cycles? And maybe you can talk about that for a minute or two, please. I'd be happy to. I think, you know, as I uh, listen to some of the other panels here uh, at this conference, we we hear of all this robust data and advanced analytics that, that are, exist in, in other asset uh, categories. And, and meanwhile, commercial real estate uh, is, a, is a larger category than, than equities. And, and for the longest time, there's really been a lack of, of, of meaningful data uh, that, that can be then used uh, in, in, in models and analytics. And, and it provides some level of predictability to the marketplace. Fortunately, that's changing, uh, and and as as one of the panelists in the previous group had, had mentioned, you know, you need to have critical mass of data to feed these AI engines and these quant models. Uh, it has to be normalized data uh, that uh, that uh, otherwise, it, so it will lead to uh, reasonably accurate uh, forecasting and, and predictability. Uh, I think data will play an increasing role in how we think about a discussion like this and and, and forecasting cycles. Uh, in, in the real estate market, and, I, and I, I'll predict that that discussion will start to become much more granular and much more uh, geographic-based and, and, and sector-based uh, as more and more of this data is available. Uh, you can compare uh, today, uh, clients can, can now compare and investors can compare how a, uh, an existing property is, is performing relative to its sub-market, relative to its neighborhood and its competitive set, uh, and there's some level of predictability to that. Um, property data is really starting to become robust. Tenant data is also growing as well as construction data, and this will all come together to help uh, in these forecasting models. Uh, from, from Comstack's perspective, we start to see the viability of data uh, as, as more alternative investors, notably hedge funds, start to uh, become clients of ours. Hedge funds now are one of our fastest growing segments. Uh, what these hedge funds do with our data uh, is, is really somewhat of a mystery to us. And even if they explained it to us, I don't know if we'd understand it. Uh, but they, you know, they're telling us that, that the data is available now that, that allows hedge funds uh, to populate their models and, and to start uh, trading, um, forecasting how a REIT will perform. 
testing their, their uh, hypotheses uh, across multiple MSAs, uh, searching for alpha, uh, and, and hedge funds are looking increasingly into real estate holdings uh, of, of large corporations and, and, and using that as a determining factor of how those companies will perform. Uh, and there's some regulatory issues that, uh, that will be a good byproduct of that. So, um, so I think that is an indicator that, that we're seeing at Comstack that, that more and more firms are, are really relying on data in this space. Uh, and I think it'll play a much larger role in this next cycle. Great. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, I don't have any data to support this, but, but considering the, the individuals and the other panels that we've had in, in the technology we were talking about, but I'm, I am convinced that commercial real estate is absolutely at the bottom of, of the, the barrel when it comes to um, technology, whether it being used for data, and a lot of the data that, that's out there is, is false. A lot of the data you get, you get it from brokers, you get it from people, and it's, it's inaccurate data. If you look at the way real estate companies are run, the way they, they maintain their files, the way they maintain their, their, their deal sheets, uh, the way they maintain their records, it, it's incredible that it's, it's so far behind the rest of the world. Um, I had a, I was at a cocktail party out in the West Coast, and it was a family office uh, uh, party, and I met uh, Eric Lai, just literally, we were having a drink together, we bumped into each other. And he said his wife is in real estate, and he was, he was one of the co-founders of LinkedIn. And his wife's in real estate, she's, she's doing some development, and he said, I got a question for you. He said, why doesn't real estate use blockchain more? And I said, you know, that's a damn good question because we don't use it, and there's so many places that it could, and you know, his point was go to the low-hanging fruit. For example, servicing of mortgages uh, is not done in a very technological manner. It's not done, there's not one system that cuts across the whole industry, which there should be. I mean, this is basic stuff. This is collecting payments, collecting taxes, are things paid? It's not done. The, te the industry does not have a technology that covers something as simple as that. If you look at each and every one of the developers, owners, institutions, they all have their own systems. They've all spent a, a gazillion dollars on this stuff, uh, but none of them overlap. And quite frankly, every time I talk to a user, they all complain. The users are sitting there. These are people who are technologically smart, not like the guys who are running it. And they sit there and say, this stuff, is and I'll, I'll clean up the language, but this stuff really is terrible. We need technology in commercial real estate. Um, and that's an area of real opportunity. I know I'm getting way off track no, no, here. No, no, no. We, uh, you know, we had that discussion last year. You should have been on the panel. Uh, you didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I would just chime in and say I think that's exactly right. Uh, and in this, in this so-called prop tech space, uh, I think we've seen capital inflows uh, just this year of, of, of nearly $4 billion, some of that being allocated to this co-working space that's been, I think, incorrectly categorized as, as technology. But nonetheless, there's an enormous inflow of new capital uh, investing in companies uh, that are emerging to try to address exactly what you're saying. I think it's exactly right. There's a, there's a new, there's a, very quickly, there's a new product out called CPACE, and that's what this Emrin, this technology company that I'm working on, is looking to do. And we've been talking to the attorneys, the attorneys and some of the other investors. And it's only a billion dollar market, which will grow to 100 billion, but there's no documentation. There's no, there's nothing in the industry that, that you could say, okay, this is consistent with each and every lender. It's, and it needs technology, and quite frankly, I think that's where we're gonna make some money on it, is utilizing our technology in that product, so, sorry. No, great. So, um, just to, I wanna ask a, a panel question. Um, you know, we've seen big disruptions in how the world views the use and operating model of office space. Um, do you see similar trends happening in the multifamily market? And is there a multifamily as hospitality model in our future? And so, Ben, maybe you're the, as the multifamily expert on the panel. Sorry, Joe. Uh, you know, why don't you try to answer that question? You know, we are not doing this in our portfolio, but we have seen a lot of our peers who are starting to do Airbnb within the apartment communities, and it's been pretty successful. I mean. Um, I know someone who wears, runs a very successful uh, vacation rental company, and we've discussed, you know, buying apartment communities and putting Airbnb in there. And I mean, the numbers are astronomical if they work out. I mean, it's kind of a hotel model, but for the multifamily operators who are doing it, um, it's very limited. I would say maybe five percent or less of their 
uh, community uh, has uh, Airbnb. But um, I, I, would, I, I, think, I think it has some opportunities in the future for that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's already starting on a, in a very granular type level. Because people want to live in the, in the urban setting, and of course urban setting, especially with new development, is, is very, very expensive. So what do you do? You've got you to gotta get your expenses down as a developer. So what they're doing is they're making smaller spaces, and people are willing, because they want to be in an urban environment, they'll take a smaller space and, and, and hopefully be able to have an affordable rent. But what that requires is still you need some sort of communal, additional communal space. And you're starting to see it in some of the new developments. There's one over in Brooklyn that's just open. Uh, we, WeWorks went in, but they're talking about, or not talking, they have bigger communal areas where people can inter interact, whether it be through a work environment, uh, uh, whether it be through a socializing type environment, or whether it be through a family environment. So I think it's happening. Um, the question becomes, how do you, because let's face it, it goes back to debt. Developers got to borrow. How do you how do you price that into your model as an owner or as a developer, and therefore how do you get the lender to go ahead and lend on that particular on that particular uh, uh, advantage point that you've got in your project as 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 it, so it adds to the value of the property. Therefore, I can borrow more or borrow you know the appropriate amount. So it's coming, but it's it's I think realistically it's it's, it's a bit ways a way off. But it'll show up in the ur in urban environment, I think. Yeah, that'll be kind of, I mean, that's kind of scary if they start valuing apartment communities based on um, a significant amount of yeah. Airbnb in there. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about getting rents that are three to four times uh, per month, what you're normally getting. I mean, that inflation would just be uh, incredible. And so when you talk to lenders about this, you know, they're, they're, they're actually limiting the amount of, Airbnb types of things that you can do at these properties to maybe 5% or 10%. But even then, they're not going to give you any credit for the additional revenue that you're getting from that. And I can appreciate that because the last thing we, we already have interest rates driving up asset values. The last thing we need is uh, temporary uh, rentals inflating values. That, that'll just lead to, a, I think, a financial disaster in uh, the apartment space. I, I agree, but you know what? I, was, um, I can say this from the perspective of being a lender for 20 years. Lenders aren't exactly the most innovative, institutional lenders aren't exactly the most uh, innovative type of, of individuals. If it can be figured out and it can be done correctly so that it's a consistent, stable cash flow generator, it, it, you, can then, you can then go ahead, they'll go ahead and, and lend against it. But until that time, I agree, it's, it's kind of pie in the sky. It's a, it's a great equity model. I mean, if you go in and you underwrite it as just a regular apartment community, but you're budgeting and the, and the lender will allow you to do more than 5 or 10% Airbnb, and you're, maybe you're budgeting 15, 20% of Airbnb or something like that. I mean, that's a substantial uh, cash yield, substantial IRR, just with traditional equity. Maybe based on your valuation, you're at maybe 50% or maybe even below 50% leverage. But even with that low leverage, the return would be uh, phenomenal. So uh, on a personal note, um, I'm kind of weed out, but where do you see the real estate as service model going? Where does CompStack see that? Well, I think the, uh, interestingly enough, I, I think, and I'm, uh, it's great to have uh, multifamily experts on, on this panel as well. We, we don't really cover the multifamily segment. However, we see uh, most categories, uh, industrial, retail, and office behaving more and more like multifamily businesses. Um, I think we work is the, where I think we're all a little bit weed out, and, and certainly for us, our, our clients uh, are generating more uh, queries on, on the WeWork uh, footprint, uh, and we are as well on their behalf uh, than any other requests that we've gotten, not surprisingly. Uh, I think it's important um, when we look at WeWork specifically that we, we attempt to bifurcate uh, the notion of this, of the, the, I'll, I'll dust off a, uh, a dot com phrase, irrational exuberance, uh, with respect to the, the valuation placed on that, on that WeWork business. Um, incorrectly, perhaps, categorized as more of a technology business, 
but when we lay uh, the WeWork holdings against other co-working businesses and against traditional real estate, uh, this valuation uh, that's, that's currently, as opposed to the, I think it was something like $47 billion, the current valuation is around eight. That seems to be uh, more accurate. Um, but let's not ignore what WeWork has done and the trend that co-working uh, is, they've really accelerated this uh, and, and in some ways uh, enhanced this co-working space for office. And, and we see absolutely this trend continuing. Uh, and, and with, you know, and, there, and there's one factor here I think that, that's, that's super important uh, to take note of. And, and this was just recently changed. Uh, but new, we talk a lot about regulation uh, on this panel. There's new legislation, uh, and this this was changed in that they're giving companies more time to comply with it. But um, you may not know that that uh, office leases, as an example, um, are are today largely held off the balance sheet of of large corporations. They appear in the notes section under these new GAAP regulations, and I, and and this is still in front of Congress. Uh, but under these new GAAP regulations, those lease obligations, if they're material to the business, will need to move over to the, uh, the balance sheet. Um, this could have a, an enormous impact on creditworthiness of, of, of large corporations that own a lot of, or, or excuse me, lease a lot of space, whether that's office or industrial, and that could cause uh, a significant change in, in how they think about uh, their, their own real estate footprints. Um, and, and so we really see this as something to keep our eyes on, but I think it goes without saying that that will be an additional tailwind to this co-working uh, environment and, uh, you know, will continue to drive folks to move away from uh, leasing office space in the traditional way and going for a much more flexible uh, co-working structure going forward. You might also see uh, many companies uh, who, who have a lot of cash on the books move away from leasing space and, and, and purchasing space as well. Uh, and that also could have an impact on the overall real estate um, sector. WeWork was the, the, I, WeWork was the greatest marketing sham pulled upon investors. I don't care what you say. It's a real estate deal with the model being we've got long-term uh, uh, leases and we're going to rent it to non-credits for the most part on short-term leases. This thing was a disaster waiting to happen. Then they were being valued as a technology company. It's not a technology company. It's a real estate company. And they're basing it upon, valuing it upon as a technology company based upon revenue versus a real estate company that's going to be uh, based upon EBITDA or net operating income. They were basing it on revenue, not on bottom line. Um, every one of these co-working, major co-working companies at some point has gone bankrupt anyway and then come back and done quite well. Okay, but because they, they ran it as a real estate company with good management. It's, it's a great idea. I think it's terrific. Corporations like it. But it's, WeWork is, is an aberration. I'm sorry. And it was, it was inevitable. So we have, uh, I think, a couple of minutes left. I uh, was wondering if we could take some audience questions. Anybody out there have a question for the panel? No? Okay. Oh, well, there is a question. Back I'm in the sorry. Back there. Go ahead. So the question, if I get this right, is um, how does, how do you uh, fix, sort of, how do you create more multifamily housing? Yeah, they're doing, they've actually done one of those projects out in Brooklyn over by the Barclays Center. And I mean, it's just, it's quite frankly, it's, it's, and I'm not an expert on it, but it is a, it's a method of cheaper construction. And they're basically building these units and then stacking them up. And there's one right by the Barclays Center uh, that's being done. And I suspect it's, I, I think it's, it's a, 
assuming I assume the engineering I assume the construction is all done correctly and if it can be done in a cheaper manner I you know I think it's I think it's a great idea has it taken hold I mean do they still most multifamily is still just you know uh, uh, sticks and bricks they call it you know but uh, I think realistically uh, that's that's a technique especially in the urban areas where instead of bringing in, in all of the work that's needed on in a, in a tight urban area where they're basically bringing in the units and stacking them up. It just takes less room, it's easier, it's more efficient. So I think your friends are right. Um, and it, it's really kind of at its infancy. Okay, so I, I think we're pretty much out of time. And it went by quickly. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.